morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. First of all, I would like to thank you all for being here. I mean, Steve said last week, he said, you'll want to be here because it's going to be good. I feel like he set the bar kind of high, but um, my hope and prayer is that you all are edified in this sermon. This last couple, these last couple of weeks, I was thinking about what to talk about. And in contemplation of the book of Hebrews, actually taking a class right now in college on Hebrews. And chapter four is one that has stuck out to me. And to me, it shows the sweetness of the rest of God. And you'll come to see this as we walk through the text. But there are four main points that I would like for you all to take away from this. And some of them are going to seem a little bit confusing when I list them, but I hope I can explain it a little bit. The first one is the importance of fear. The importance of fear. The second one is the inaugurated eschatology of rest. I'm going to break that down a little bit, but hang with me. The third is true versus misguided rest. True versus misguided rest. And the last one is the sweetness of rest. So if any of you are familiar with the book of Hebrews, you know that it's not exactly like the rest of the books in the New Testament. You have the Gospels that are more narrative. You have the epistles, more like a letter. You have a greeting, a body, a conclusion. And you have like Revelation is kind of in its own category, very eschatological. But with Hebrews, you start in the very first chapter and it's not like any of those. It starts, it starts like a story. It says, long ago, many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And it's almost like he's bringing his audience in before he's about to deliver this powerful message as if it were a sermon. And you can tell it's very sermonic in this structure because he, he goes in and out of exposition and exhortation. He talks about Old Testament passages and how they speak of Christ. And then he goes on to talk about what then should we do if that is true and since it is true. The thing is, it follows this pattern and it does so with most of the cases by highlighting a greater than and lesser than. In chapter one, it talks about how Jesus is greater than the angels. It talks about in chapter two, much the same thing. And in chapter three, Jesus is greater than Moses in the the mediation he makes. In chapters five and seven, talks about Jesus as the greater high priest. In chapter 8, it talks about the covenant that he brings about, the new covenant, as being greater than the Old Testament. He even says, he finds fault with it, saying, and then describes the new covenant. In chapter 9, it's a little bit different of a flavor because instead of saying it's a greater than um, tabernacle, a heavenly tabernacle, he says that it's a shadow of the heavenly tabernacle, which is the earthly one. And in chapter 10, he talks about the sacrifice, how Christ's sacrifice is greater than those under the old covenant. But in chapter 4, it takes on a similar mode as chapter 9 does. It's not a better, it's not just a better rest and a lesser rest in Christ and before Christ. Instead, he talks about rest as something that was present from creation in the seventh day. He talks about rest as established for the wilderness wilderers, the wilderness wanderers. He talks about rest in the days of David, and he talks about rest as something that we can all partake in to this day. And so, starting in chapter 4, if you would join me, I'm going to read through the verses. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. Verse 1. 
Therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed entered that rest, just as he has said. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. This is the word of God for the people of God. Speak God. Usually that comes at the end, but I just, this is a beautiful passage, and I'm just, I'm excited for you all to be here with me this morning. So, if you notice at the very beginning of the passage, it starts with, therefore. And something that cues us off to is a conclusion that was made before. Now, the biblical authors, they weren't operating under these chapter and verse categories because for the author of Hebrews, he was writing and he was writing and he wrote from the beginning to the end. And so when he says, therefore, it's not like he's shifting from a chapter to a chapter, but enumerating on a point made before. So it takes us back to chapter 3. I'm going to read from verse 12 to get us a little bit of the context of what he's saying and the conclusions he's drawing in chapter 4. He says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of disbelief. So it's like he's drawing this area of exposition. He's pointing to a past situation in the wilderness wanderers, and he's saying, what's true of them and how it relates to rest? He's saying, well, this is how they failed. They failed and they did not enter his rest. And what's true of them is that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. And how does their unbelief relate to why they don't enter? Well, we get some hints in verse 12 of chapter 3. It says, take care, brethren, or be careful, some translations say, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Then you have an 18, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we have carelessness, we have disobedience, and we have unbelief leading these people to not enter into the rest of God. And then he draws his conclusion in chapter 1. Therefore, let us fear if 
while the promise remains of entering his rest, any of you may seem to have come short of it. Now, if you're like me, you ask the question when you read this verse, okay, so maybe he's talking to Maybe he's talking to just the original audience of the letter of Hebrews. He's saying, let, let us fear. But if you look at verse 3 for just a second, it seems to say, like those who believe enter that rest, for we who have believed enter that rest. And if we believe, then we have entered the rest. So it seems fair to conclude that the us here is not referring just to the original audience, the Hebrews, but to new covenant Christians, to those who believe, those who have entered his rest. Sometimes in this, this initial verse, exhortation, let us fear, we look at it as people who come from a reform background, a more Calvinistic um, to read passages like that and be a little more dismissive of it. And don't get me wrong, I'm a, I'm a full-blown Calvinist. I, uh, I believe in perseverance of the saints all the way. But when we read something like this, we have to make sure that what the audience or what the author is saying isn't just dismissed and we realize why he's saying what he's saying. And before I say that, Let me start with what I'm not saying. Letting us fear or fearing does not have to do with fearing a loss of salvation. Because we have confidence in the completed work of Christ. And to fear that would be to look at the work of Christ and say, I don't know. But we know that we have a God and we have a Savior who, when he says it is finished, it is finished. And we can have assurance and confidence in that. What I am saying is that this fear, and this is also John Piper's stance too, is that as New Covenant believers, we get into certain situations in life and we fall into certain mindsets that have us doubt, that have us be careless, that have us have an attitude of somewhat callousness. And that sounds exactly like what happened to the Wilderness Wonders. They were were careless and they didn't keep in mind the promises of God and the rest that they're about to enter. And so we are completely protected by God, but the author of Hebrews believes that even as we are protected, that we're not protected from our sinful selves, and that that is a reason to still maintain this, this attitude of, of fear and this, this mindset that keeps us oriented on the things of God. I'll give an example of this in my life, just kind of in the last week. uh, It would be really easy, it was really easy for me if I were to be a little little less faithful in the things that were going on. Um, If I were to, in hanging out with my fiance, be selfish and just say, you know, I'll only do it when it, I'll only hang out when it makes since for me and actually you know i, I want to go do these things i don't really care it's gonna it's gonna be easier for me or or to go to my studies and say i could try my best but it's gonna be a lot more it's gonna be better right now if i just kind of give some effort or, or maybe not at all and and even if i were to look at the opportunity the blessing of giving this sermon and just not prepare not be ready to enjoy and and be immersed in the Word of God. And there's something that knits all of these things together, which is it would be more restful for me to not do these things. I mean, think about it. I'd have more time. I'd expend less effort. I would be more relaxed. But... The difference between this is that it's a, and and what's true and why we should fear is because it's a misdirected rest. 
That was one of the, the first points I had. There's the misdirected rest versus true rest. And the reason it's misdirected is because it causes us to lose sight of the things that hold us close to God. And it keeps it in the front of our, our mind. That's true rest. That's what we strive to enter daily. We'll get on to a true rest in, in a little bit later of the passage. But from this, he says in verse 2, For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. There's a quote by a New Testament scholar. His last name's Guthrie, and he says, The Israelite community physically may have heard the words of their of their hearing. Sorry, I have this kind of kind of scribbled out. Have heard the words, but their hearing was hearing and faithlessness. True spiritual hearing involves active faith as a component. And so this is what the author of Hebrews is trying to get at. They heard the message. They heard about the rest of God. They saw Canaan before them. They even tried to enter it before, and they were driven out by the enemies, and, and they could not enter into it because their hearing did not go to their heart. It was a passive hearing. And what's also connected to passive hearing is the result of why they didn't enter in, is they were careless, and they are disobedient, and they had unbelief. And so you see this connection between passive hearing and faithlessness, and active hearing and faithfulness. Which leads us to verse 3, which says, For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said. Now, I'm going to break verse 3 up into two different sections. Verse 3a and verse 3b. Because 3b through 5 seems to take on this alternate argument that the author is, is putting into this section. And it serves a wonderful place, but it is at least on the surface, a little disconnected. And so what verse 3a establishes is that, as I said earlier, the people who believe and enter that rest are we. We who believe enter that rest. You could also draw, ask the question, what kind of rest are we entering? And for the Israelites, the answer would be, is the promised land. They're entering into Canaan, and they believed in God as was revealed to them on the mountain and, and in the burning bush and, and the deliverance through the Red Sea and all these things. That's the God they believe in, and that's the place, the destination of their faith and their rest. But for us, the we who believe, we have a spiritual promised land, a heavenly Canaan, and the God we believe in has revealed himself further through his Son. So with that, I'm going to get this 3b through 5 section and show how it relates to the rest. It says, Just as he has said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. It seems separate because he goes from this point in verse 3 saying, we who have believed into this rest, you think he's going to explain this belief and, and this rest and the goodness of it, but he goes on to talk about swearing in his wrath, they will not enter his rest. And then he talks about how his works came from the foundation of the world. And then he does this thing where he quotes Genesis 2, 2, of all places from Psalm 95, where it says, They shall not enter my rest. It says, And God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And it leaves the reader thinking, What's going on here? And two things. One, it emphasizes the hope of what could be we if we believe in this rest. And he's building up his case where it's going to be in verse 6, the sweetness of it. And the reason he does this 
is because he uses this first century Jewish interpretive method called verbal analogy. And verbal analogy, what it does is it takes one passage and takes another. It sees the word that connects both of them, that's present in both, and it stitches both passages together in a way that explains both of them in a coherent way. And so in this case, Psalm 95, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. In Genesis 2, 2, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. The author's point here is, you see rest? Well, the rest is beyond just the wilderness wanderers. It's beyond just when David writes that in Psalm 95. It goes all the way back to creation and the establishment of this rest from the beginning. And so, his point is to say, he's starting to build this point of rest being something that's both there and here and here and what will be in an inaugurated eschatological sense. You see, I'm starting to link these together. Then he goes on in verse 6. And he says, Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. Verse 7, He again fixes a certain day today, saying through David after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. This is absolutely wonderful for the modern reader because what it does is it shows that the rest is still available. What God could have done is said, I'm going to establish my rest over here. I'm going to speak through David in Psalm 95 to say that the rest still remains. But you believers, you have to put your faith, you have to try to enter into that rest. You're going to try to enter into Canaan back here. But no, what he says is today extends beyond that time and that time and this time. And guess what? It's even going to go into the future because this rest has not yet been completely fulfilled. There's another scholar, New Testament scholar, Grant Osborne. And he says in talking about the today of this passage that there's four different todays. He says the first one is Moses' day, what I keep referring to as the wilderness wanderers. There's David when he wrote Psalm 95 hundreds of years later. And then there's the readers of Hebrews, the original audience. And that today was still today. And then ultimately, in the eschaton, at the end of times, we enter into God's Sabbath rest. And what this does is it shows us, it shows us that each day is an opportunity to enter into his rest because each day presents opportunity to live and contribute to heaven on earth. There's a quote by another guy. He says, the rest is fundamentally eschatological and yet the eschaton has penetrated the present. And so today is not something that is once you believe, pause, once you get into heaven. But it's an opportunity to live each day as today and to enter into God's rest. Because if the eschaton has penetrated the present, then our attitude towards the eschaton must also penetrate the present. It helps us to live in what is true rest right now instead of relying on the things that are um, misguided rest and false rest. I keep throwing out this distinction between true rest and, and misguided rest or, or false rest, and I think it, it might be helpful to, to describe what I'm not talking about in, in misguided rest. What I'm not talking about is enjoying things that are restful. I'm not talking about enjoying sitting on the couch and, and watching some TV. I'm not talking about enjoying a scenic walk. What I'm talking about is doing things that removes you from God 
and shifts your vision from him onto things that ultimately don't fulfill, that are in the moment restful. And as the wilderness wanderers, they have this carelessness and the, this disobedience and this unbelief that resulted from this losing sight of the promises of God and the rest that lay before them in Cain in the promised land. Four, if Joshua had given them rest, verse eight, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So the author's point here of Hebrews is that, as I was talking about at the beginning of the message, that chapter 4 is different from a lot of the sections of Hebrew and that it's not just this greater than, less than relationship, but that it establishes a shadow fulfilled in the thing that casts the shadow later. And in this case, Joshua guided and led the Israelites into the promised land. After the faithless generation died, God raised up Joshua, told him to lead the people into the promised land, led them over the Jordan River, and there they were. And yet the author of Hebrews is here saying, for if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of it another day after that. And so it leaves the reader thinking, I thought he led them into the rest. I thought he led them into the promised land. But the author's point is once again, this rest goes beyond just a physical place. This rest goes beyond just today. It is tomorrow and it is the eschaton and so it also leaves the reader maybe thinking well is that rest not is that not a fulfilling is that not a restful rest and the answer is no it was beautiful the land was described as flowing with milk and honey and it was fruitful and the harvest was bountiful and it was supposed to be a place where the enemies were subdued below them and it was it was a wonderful rest but the reason it was so wonderful as it was is because it was a shadow of what will be so there remains a sabbath rest for the people of god and this is what I was talking about with being fundamentally eschatological or in the end times, is that this kind of rest goes beyond just now. It remains for the people of God. But wait a second, I keep hitting this drum because it's so essential. In verse three, we who I believe enter that rest. So are we in the rest or will we enter that rest? Yes, <laughs> the answer is yes. And so <laughs> in this verse, it also describes the rest as a Sabbath rest. And that's not just a minute detail because the word here, Sabbath rest, describes festival celebration and, and rejoicing and, and communion and all this stuff. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we, we grow up in this uh, Christian culture that feeds us an idea of heaven being, you know, people sitting on, on clouds and playing harps, sitting around doing boring things. But this is not the idea that the author of Hebrews has in mind. It's sweet. It's wonderful. It's exciting. And that is the Sabbath rest that we enter into at the end. Verse 10. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Once again, inaugurated rest here. Entered into the rest puts us into what will be ultimate rest by resting from our works right now. And the reason it's not fulfilled and, and ultimate is because we still live in a place where we strive to enter in the rest daily. As we'll see in verse 11, therefore let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same examples of disobedience. So we have this idea of this widened perspective of, of entering the rest. It's not just something that's a, a one and done, once again, 
enter the rest at salvation and wait until the end times to enter the rest again. Striving to enter the rest is the difference between true rest and misguided rest. The difference between active and passive listening and active and passive faith that as New Testament, New Covenant Christians, we still exercise daily. When we wake up, it's still a decision to be faithful to our families and our friends and to God. And it's still just as much of a possibility to choose to do the things that draw us away or distract us, to be careless, to be disobedient. And that's what the exhortation of the author is, don't be like that. Because that is going to lead you to lose sight on the promises of God, to have a form of disbelief. And then, to put the the stamp on the message, so to speak, he he gives this very well-known, well-quoted couple of verses. Verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. If you notice, it talks about the word of God, and then it refers to him, or to it, I showed my cards already, as a hymn in verse 13. And the purpose of this is to show that the Word of God holds such authority and power that the author can refer to it as an extension, as a part, as connected to God in the way it judges, in the way it discerns, in the way it's living and active just as God is. And it does all these things because it is the Word of God as personified. There's a, uh, as far as, this is probably a point of interest for some of you, looking at where it says that it divides soul and spirit. Sometimes there's a distinction there made saying, oh, is the author pointing to this passage saying we have a soul and we have a spirit and here's the difference is that the word of God, the reason that they're separate is the word of God can separate them. And there are In my research, there wasn't a scholar who saw that as a good point to go to, to establish the distinction. Instead, they say that it shows, it shows the creativity of the author and the power of the word of God. He also says in the point of, in this personifying thing, um, scholar by the name of Attridge. First century Judaism and early Christian thought held the word of God to be creative, administering, and judging force, which at times was personified. Kind of in conclusion, I I said that I wanted you to remember four things, or four main points from this message. is the importance of fear, which is as new covenant Christians, it's not somehow unimportant for us to keep in mind the things of God and to strive for them, to exercise true rest daily as we live into heaven on earth, as image bearers of God, to exercise active hearing. I said true rest versus false rest. It's again the, the difference between the two, one being a result of um, callousness and, and disobedience and carelessness, the other being one that keeps your eyes maintained on the sweetness of the rest of God and his promises. The third thing, inaugurated eschatology of rest, that is both it is both today, it is both tomorrow today. And it is in the eschaton, the end times. And we see God's usage of this employed in the wilderness wanderers through David in Psalm 95 and the original readers of Hebrews and us as we read it today. 
And then finally, we see the sweetness of God's Sabbath rest. We see a shadow of this in the promised land in Canaan. We see part of it today in the peace that we have is following God and an assurance for our, our soul and our salvation that one day we might enter into the true rest of God. That it is a festive celebration and communion with saints and with God and having joy unspeakable and excitement. My hope is that this is an encouraging message that is edifying and that somehow these principles, these ideas can live in your mind today. Just think about them and mull over them. You will please join me in prayer. Lord, I I feel like at times like a, a David or as someone who is the least of these and my prayer is just that your spirit would use what I've shared today to work in the hearts of the congregation because your word is living and active and it does divide between soul and spirit as sharper than a two-edged sword and it reveals the intentions of the heart and, and God I just I know that you are able to work through this and I pray that the I pray that we would not be like wilderness wanderers who lose sight of you and in carelessness have passively here but that our, our hearing might result in, in action and in a joy that we experience today, tomorrow, and all days until you return in glorious splendor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.